Sewing finds its way into so many facets of our lives. It impacts our families, brings us new friends, provides us with a way to serve others, and all the beautiful things that we can make with our hands and sewing machines. If you are in a room full of people that sew, you can feel the excitement and creativity. It makes you want to rush right home to your sewing room so you can get started on another inspired project. I am so thankful for all the friends that this sewing business has brought into my life, and I can't wait to show you the sewing inspiration we have for you today. Shall we begin? This is one of the most wonderful ideas on a way to use your wonderful quilting skills to do something a little bit different. This is a curtain for a room or a window panel. You can use any quilting techniques you want, any fabrics you want. This one is especially cute because it has little dancing frogs and little dancing cows who also happen to be ballerinas. So this would be great for a child's room. The tabs are really nice across the top to be put in your curtain rod. And then there's another very, very nice feature on the bottom, which has the little triangles or the little points that are stitched right to the bottom. bottom. This is absolutely an adorable way to decorate a child's room. And this is another adorable quilt. This is very a very easy quilt to do, which involves some applique and, and just a precious quilt. And one thing I might say is that we have used flame retardant um, batting in this quilt, so as well as the wall hanging. So that gives us a little bit of extra protection, especially when we're doing a child's quilt. I'm so happy to have as my guest today, my friend Phyllis Dobbs. Phyllis is one of my very favorite, favorite fabric and quilt designers, and she is a representative of the Warm Company. Phyllis, welcome to the show. Thank you, Martha. It's a delight to be here. <laughs> I'm very glad to be here. I'm going to show you a little bit how to construct the uh, window curtain here that was out of a uh, quilting technique also. But to start off, I'm going to show you the uh, points are the triangles that were at the bottom. You will stitch two triangle pieces together, and I've already got these stitched. You trim the uh, corners so that when you turn them right side out, you have a uh, real uh, crisp corner. So then I'm going to turn it right side out. And there's one of the triangles. You'll need four of these for the window curtain that I made. And then the tabs at the top they are made uh, with a triangle of fabric. You sew the side seam, and then you turn these right side out also. So I'll turn this one. You make sure when you sew it that you use uh, lock the stitches on each end so that when you are uh, turning it that the uh, seam does not come undone at the ends. So this is turned uh, right side out, and you, when you, uh, you press it then flat, and you have the seam going down the center of the back so that when you have the uh, loops that they are uh, a little more neat looking with the seam not at the side but at the uh, back. So then you will fold it like this and then that's ready to insert in your quilt for your uh, the top loops. Okay, and I'm going to show how that you insert these and how you do the final construction of the quilt. Once you have your quilt put together, then you will uh, put the tabs at the top and you will put the quilt top right side down on the backing. So you'll cut a backing the same size as your quilt top. Then we'll put them right sides together on top of the batting. Okay, then you will take your tabs and you'll space them evenly all the way across the top. So you can uh, do your calculations and then figure out the distance to put them apart. These were three inches apart. Okay, and then you'll tape, uh, pin them to the top edge so that they align evenly. And also on the ones on the side, this is a little trick that I do. I will take and flip the tab over and pin it in place so that it doesn't get caught when you're sewing the side seam. So I do that on both sides. I just turn it over and pin it in place and then I will pin all that together to sew it. Now for the uh, 
the uh, points at the bottom, it's the same way. You just insert them evenly spaced across the uh, bottom of the quilt between the top layer and the back layer. And then you will uh, pin all that in place and sew it. And when you sew it, you will leave an opening and you turn it inside out and then all of your uh, tabs and your points at the bottom will just fall out in place and then you press it and then sew a seam around the edge to hold it secure. Exactly. Phyllis, thank you so much for that adorable wall hanging and that wonderful quilt. And I'm also very, very excited about this flame resistant batting. Oh, it's wonderful. Just add mm -hmm. adds that safety feature. It does. And especially bit for helps. children's mm -hmm. rooms, for curtains, and for children's quilts. Mm -hmm. Phyllis, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. And now I have a doll dressing idea for you. I'm going to share with you an absolutely magical technique in just a few minutes on how to apply that perfect, perfect tiny piping. Now, where have we used perfect tiny piping? Well, today it's on the doll dress. This beautiful little doll dress made out of the blue Swiss Batiste has the gathered French lace around the neckline, entredeau, a sweet little high yoke, and this is the perfect piping. I'm telling you, it is on here perfectly straight, and there is a trick to that. This smocking, although it looks like hand smocking, has been done by machine. It's absolutely beautiful. The sweet little puff sleeves have the traditional French dress finish of the entredeau, the beading, which you can run ribbon through, the entredeau and the gathered lace edging. And if you'll come down to her sweet little skirt, and isn't she just dressed up for Sunday school or a special party? Um, here is the entredeau lace insertion, French lace insertion, French lace insertion, and French lace edging. I might add it's very easy to attach those three laces. You simply butt them together and zigzag. Now let's go back to that piping trick I promised you. Perfect piping and getting it straight is sometimes a little complicated, especially on the top row of smocking or around the Peter Pan collar. Now that's kind of a mouthful, perfect piping on Peter Pan collar. And sometimes when you try to turn it and you have to hand baste it, but we have, I have a trick for you. It's called the wash away basting tape. Now let me show you how it works. Here's the piping as you would attach it to the top of the smocking, like on the little doll dress. Okay, this is a wash away basting tape. And by the way, we use this to attach perfect zippers also. If you've ever had a zipper that twisted and moved a little bit and then you had to take the whole thing out. All right, I'm going to line it up with the pleating threads, but the first thing I'm going to do is to turn it back and I'm going to cut the um, put the, the piping, by the way, I mean the uh, wash away basting tape has one sticky side that I'm going to very, very carefully line up. I'm probably going to take my shish kebab stick here to help me. I'm going to very perfectly line it up along the row of stitching on the piping. Here we go along the piping. And I'm going to cut it, and the sticky side is down. Now remember, this is all wash away, so when I get through the sewing, it just washes away. Now there is a paper portion on the top, so let me get the paper piece, and now pull off the paper, and I have a sticky piece, and I'm going to line this up on the top row of pleating on my smocking. You can honestly line it up perfectly with the rows of pleating. Now that is literally stuck into place and it is so wonderful because your piping is gonna be perfect every time. Now the next step is going to be to straight stitch in the ditch of that piping. And I'll tell you the truth, over the years I have found that to use um, a double needle pin tuck foot or a zipper foot or something, even working with tiny piping or maybe a small cording foot, but I'll tell you to use the um, double needle pin tuck feet usually works well to get that stitching exactly on the edge and then you're going to trim away the excess you see I've trimmed it here and I've left it here I've straight stitched it perfectly and now I'm ready to get that to put the rest of the skirt or the bodice in this case it would be the bodice so the yoke of the dress I'm going to put it down I'm going to straight stitch and actually I can stitch the second stitch on that same row of stitching that I just made and I can turn it back 
and there will be perfect piping every single time. And I will tell you that this trick is, is one that our students who are beginning sewing teachers, who are teaching beginning sewing, as well as smocking construction people that want just perfect smock construction and that perfect piping. Those are some kinds of tricks that they love, and I think you will too, and it's this wash away basting tape that is really, really a magical answer. And you could use it for hemming and for a lot of things, but zippers and this perfect piping are our two favorite ways to use the wash away basting tape. And now I have a wonderful sewing inspiration to share with you. Sometimes you just want to take a commercial pattern and add some heirloom to it. This exquisite sundress is exactly that situation. Puffing has been added around this elegant part that goes around and ties behind and puffing has been added right here at the waist which means that this was a commercial pattern that is now a beautiful heirloom piece. I'm so happy to have as my guest today Amelia Johansson. Hello, Amelia is the associate editor of So Beautiful magazine and I'm so glad you're I'm here. Welcome to, to the show be here. in that beautiful dress Thank you made. You. <laughs> I also have a blouse on right now. This is a ready-to-wear piece, and I bring it up because it shows that designers have come into heirloom again. There's puffing here, there's puffing here, and it's taken a basic silhouette and added an heirloom touch to it, and we can do that ourselves as evidenced by the dress. This is a particular commercial pattern we used. It is a halter, basic halter piece, which you'll find in any commercial pattern. This particular one happened to be a blouse pattern, which we made into a dress by adding the skirt. Uh, you, the problem is with a halter pattern, um, for puffing, you need a separate piece. This particular pattern was one piece. We broke it into two by redrafting a little bit, discarding this, and you come up with two separate pieces, the halter piece and the main bodice piece. And these would be cut apart. And I'm going to hand this to you because okay. I'm going to need that okay. again later I'll on. hold it. We've added the seam allowance here, which you need to put the pieces back together to both pieces, the bodice and the halter. And now we're going to the fun part, which is the puffing. You can do puffing many ways. You can just gather it with a elongated stitch. But when you're using a piece that's this long, it's a lot easier if you stitch over a draw cord. And you can use any number of cords. This one is relatively narrow, but it has to be strong enough to pull. So these were both zigzagged over a draw cord on each side, and then you're pulling them to create your puffing. And you can do one at a time, get my threads out of the way, or you can do them together to get a more even look. And you're gonna wanna make sure that your puffing is vertically lined up. You don't want it all whopper jawed. So we have this piece and we've drawn it up to the shape of the pattern piece gotcha. that we created earlier. And we just laid it directly down on the board uh, so that you can follow that. You're obviously going to need to pull one of your cords a little bit tighter to get a, you know, a, a sharper curve on the inside and then a, and, and match it up to the curve of the piece. On this particular example, because we need to stabilize it, we've done it on the wrong side. We've added a, um, here we have a, an adherable stabilizer which you will press on on, right on your piece. You'll remove your piece then. At this point, you're gonna to come to the stage where I, we piped it, because you need to have a, a nice seam in between the main bodice and the puffed, bodice, the puffed halter. So you've got it all adhered and, and stabilized with your interfacing that was ironed on. You're going to add puffing, or excuse me, you're gonna add piping along the edge in that curved shape on both sides. We've got that down. And now we come back to the piece that I would mentioned earlier. Again, this is our separate bodice piece that we drafted. Okay. You're cutting this out. You've got a center bodice. And before you add your uh, halter pieces, you need to pipe the center so everything is okay. congruous. Then you're going to come back in and add your piping piece or your puffing piece that you created with puffing onto the arm side of the halter which you've done here, stitched along that piping line, flipped it, done it to both sides. Here we have it finished with a nice puffed edge here. That is so and this pretty. will be lined eventually, so, so all of this will be gone. And then at the bottom, we create another puffing piece here and add it 
to the bottom and then add the, another piece of piping would be added here and the skirt on and then your finishing techniques, your lining, you know, your buttonholes and all, all of the rest. So that that's how we've taken a basic pattern and turned it into an heirloom look that um, it's very today. It's right now you'll it, see it everywhere. It is so. very today. It's mm -hmm. very beautiful. And one of our favorite so beautiful models, Elizabeth, modeled this for the magazine. And mm -hmm. she's I think Elizabeth is twenty five and she absolutely loved the dress. It, it was it, it's it's a really nice look right it's now. It's a really nice mm -hmm. look and she was just thrilled with this dress. It's a big girl look for heirlooms. So. It absolutely is. Amelia, mm -hmm. thank you so much. Oh, you're so much. welcome. And now I have some hand embroidery for you. I'm so happy to have as my guest today, my dear friend, Sandy Jenkins. Sandy is one of the hand embroidery experts of the world, and it's such a pleasure to have you Thank here you on the Martha. show today, Sandy. It's what are you going to share here. with our viewers today? Today, I would like to talk about needles and hoops, just basic embroidery, and we'd like to show outline or stem stitch. Um, the first thing I will tell you is a good hoop is invaluable. My great grandmother bought one hoop in her life and made it a good one. And so if you'll do that, you don't have the screw falling off and not holding tight and all kinds of problems. Uh, what I use is a wooden hoop. I guess you could use any kind, there are many kinds, plastic, ster sterling, silver, all kinds of hoops, but I like a hardwood one that holds really tight and has a really good screw. So that's really important. Another thing is people are always asking what size hoop. A five or six inch hoop is just perfect for most designs. You can turn the any way and get close to wherever you're working. And that's an important thing. And it's important to turn your work in your hoop as you're having um, trouble trying to get in one area it's nice just to turn it and make it easier for yourself um, needles are very important also for regular embroidery I use a size 8 needle and um, most things are perfect with that with two or three threads and that's what I normally use I'd like to start today and show you outline or stem stitch and when I tell you outline or stem you're thinking which one am I gonna do <laughs> it doesn't really matter what you call it outline or stem. The only difference is it's the same look, but one, you're going to hold your thread up when you're stitching, one, you're going to hold it down. So we're not going to care what we call it. We're just going to do it. I always take, carry a knot. So I'm going to come up through the fabric with a knot. And I'm going to do this uh, in a poke and punch manner today, Martha, in order to let you see it easier. But normally I do swing my needle. And if you're wondering what swinging your needle is, swinging your needle is when you take a stitch and come up in the same step. So I'm gonna do one stitch of that, but I am gonna poke and punch for the rest of it. I'm gonna hold my work back with my fingers on my left hand because it just allows your tension to be held a little tighter and it keeps it out of the way so you can make a nice stitch. I'm gonna go a ways, a little ways away and come up about half the distance. Now, one of the really unique things about outline and stem is that you can do any size um, or any shape, I should say. Um, to know what size stitch you should use, I was taught that a dressmaker pen, the old timey silver head pens that we used to use, or still use, I guess, silk pens, and that is what you use to judge your size. And you're thinking, oh my goodness, it's that is so very stitch. tiny. <laughs> now, nowadays, people don't do quite that size of stitch, but that was what I was taught was the perfect size stitch. Was the width so, of the pen. Absolutely, the oh, width Sandy. of the head of the pen, which is very tiny, as you can see. We're going to say two or three threads of your fabric. Uh, you come up in the loop on the line. Now, another question that's asked a lot, do you go above the line for coming up and down below it for going down? You do neither. You go on the line for coming up and on the line for going down. The stitch itself, when you see it, it looks like you have made it a little bit crooked, but you don't. You just follow the line and the stitch lays crooked by itself. Um, I'm going to do just a little bit more, and then I have an example, actually several examples on the quilt that I've brought. 
and you're just going to pull each step up totally tight so that your tension is the same. The more you do, the better your tension will be. A good example of the outline stem, there are many on the quilt, but one that you can see done with a slightly over dyed thread is the dog. It's totally outlined and the bone with the, with the uh, outline or stem stitch. Now, there's one more thing that I would show you that people have trouble with, and that's how to turn a corner or really make a point. A 90 degree angle is another thing. If you will get clear to the point with your stitch, your last stitch will be very small. Pull it straight up, and you're going to turn slightly. Make your next stitch totally straight with that and pull it up tight. It makes a perfect 90 degree angle. And I'm gonna pull this one up and show you. See how that nicely, that turned the corner? Exactly. And that's a really easy way to do it. A lot of times people will totally stop their stitch and then start it again, but this is a really, really easy way. You just take that tiny diagonal stitch on the corner and then pull it straight up and keep going. Okay. Well, that is absolutely fascinating, Sandy. And it just seems like when you do the embroidery, it just seems like you make it so easy. You know, Martha, one of my claims to fame is that I make things fun. And if you can't have fun when you're stitching, then you shouldn't stitch. You shouldn't be stitching. Or you're doing something wrong. <laughs> but it should oh, be fun, Sandy, and we should enjoy it. Thank, thank you so you. much. And I just love this little quilt. And I, and I understand you make all of your samples yourself. I do. I do. Oh, well, thank you I live so, to stitch. You live to thank stitch. You. I love it. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you and for now I have a beautiful piece of antique clothing from my vintage collection. This magnificent christening dress is a French piece. It was loaned to me by Jeannie Adams Miller in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I call it the diagonal daisy dress because it is just so beautiful and I think Jeannie said it was about 1885. The daisies are so pretty. They're Swiss embroidery, the little uh, vertical, diagonal, and, and this is the sweetest little sleeve, and it's a short sleeve, which means it's an earlier piece, like in the 1800s rather than around 1900 as the Victorian era was. I'm going to just hold this open for you to see how pretty this skirt is with the diagonal daisy pieces that come, and it's a very long dress. The diagonal daisy pieces that come all the way down the front of the dress absolutely beautiful the way the lace there's a little ruffle along each side and there's more uh, there are two pieces of lace in the middle and there's a real interesting thing that this uh, seamstress did she cut out the little daisy motifs from the swiss embroideries she cut out the little daisy motifs and and just stitched them i think that's very creative i i just kind of wonder if she was if she were almost through the dress and she thought, well, is there one more little thing I can do? Now, as we come down to the skirt, we see not one, but two little ruffles. One little ruffle, two little ruffles. Once again, a wonderful touch. And then the tucks and the ruffle on the bottom. For my sewing from the heart today, I have a wonderful letter from Jean Ann Carnahan. Dear Martha, my American Sewing Guild neighborhood group has been very active in Project Linus quilting. We have made and donated hundreds of quilts to this very special charity. The local Project Linus leader, Barb S., is a member of our American Sewing Guild group and has inspired us to make these blankets for ill and injured children. I was reluctant to put my name and address on the labels as I wanted to stay anonymous, but she told me I should. And I have since received some of the most heartwarming letters from parents of how their child has hugged the blanket or dragged the blanket everywhere and how much it has meant to them. One young mother said that it meant so much to her that someone else cared about her baby and had the faith that her child would live. Although I cannot share the actual letters with your viewers for obvious reasons, I have actually been reduced to tears over these letters and sometimes photos also. If anyone thinks that their charity work goes unnoticed, they should try giving to a cause such as this, and they would soon find out that their work really does matter. Martha, Project Linus is much like your own favorite St. Jude quilting group.
There are local chapters of Project Linus around the country. All the quilts we make go to local hospitals and children's homes. Our American Sewing Guild group also has a sewing flea market every September where we sell our leftover or unneeded sewing items. Everything from this sale is donated and all the proceeds go to Project Linus. Jean Ann, you didn't say where your group is located, but such a wonderful, wonderful project for your American Sewing Guild, a group that I love very much. Thank you for coming today. Won't you come back next time?